Hi, I'm Kai D. Wright. I'd like us to spend some time today focusing on something you've left a 15-year newbie like me to navigate. The problem with behavioral science is that it doesn't come with the GPS. As two behavioral scientists to arrive at the same destination and amongst the many theories and hundreds of cognitive biases, their roots could wildly vary. So how do we create a roadmap to behavioral science where regardless of whether you're a new driver or an experienced driver, you clearly and confidently know which way to go? This is the adoption chasm we need to cross as a field. And while Daniel Kahneman, Don Ariely, Cass Sunston, Richard Thaler, and many others have gotten us onto the big stage of the Nobel Prizes and the big screen with the big short, we have yet to crack the code of how non-behavioral scientists can easily grasp and apply principles and biases. One day, I was hosting a book club meeting with a group of my fellow University of Chicago alum. While I studied economics and everyone else studied linguistics and political science, the book we were covering was Thinking in Systems by MIT researcher and MacArthur genius Donella Meadows. Because you know, that's the kind of extracurricular reading you Chicago alum do in their 30s. At the time, I'd been teaching at Columbia for about five years. The book club was a welcome retreat from the painstaking process all academics love of creating a new course from scratch, which I had just done with Battle of the Mind, a class on the intersection of behavioral science and branding. However, my graduate students were struggling to strategically and methodically make sense of all the disjointed principles, experiments and best-selling books, and unending cognitive biases. Namely, their results would always vary and no two students would ever agree on success, often changing their approaches based on whether the entity was a company, nonprofit, consumer facing, B2B, and on and on. As you might have guessed, the first semester rollout kind of bombed. I introduced the class in spring 2017, and ironically, Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize later that year. I always prided myself on being ahead of the curve, so knew that I had to forge ahead and figure out this GPS issue within behavioral science in order to teach executives how to effectively use it in repeatable ways across their organization without all the complexity of changing the process to fit different situations. I needed a one-size-fits-all method. I'm a scholar practitioner, so I teach two semesters annually and work advising clients. As a consulting partner, I'm accustomed to unpacking complex issues. And as an educator, I'm accustomed to making those complex issues so radically simple that someone can sketch them on the back of a napkin. I've had many jobs before within communication, helping Diddy launch a hundred million dollar television network, serving on the management team for artists, including Megan Trainer and Charlie Puth, and lots of agency work in various strategy roles. And as a strategist, you learn that the best tool is to look back and look around for clues in non-traditional places. And that's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. Why are we not using systems-based thinking within behavioral science. Rather than trying to make sense of all the principles, experiments, biases for mainstream adoption, possibly we focus on the system of communication as a GPS for when to apply nudges. Like communication, well-designed systems have closed feedback loops. And if systems function as intended, they become resilient and self-sustainable. And after two years more of teaching and a hundred more students, Levesque was born. So what's the system for communication? Well, there's three elements in this system. they are lexicon, audio, and visuals. And all of those elements are gonna bang up against each other and interact. And those interactions are gonna form all different types of experiences. And those experiences are going to have an outcome. And that behavioral outcome ideally would become the function of that system, the culture that exists around the organization or around the brand. And where's the behavioral science? Well, we'll get there in a moment. Let's just keep it on cruise control for now. The new GPS was first used on the crash course of fast-growing companies. Based on past data, my logic was both 
behavioral economics, and behavioral science garnered the most traction when juxtaposed pop culture, awards, and movies. And there was nothing more pop culture than unpacking reasons for success among then current fast growing companies like SoulCycle and Peloton to Aldi and Zara. Because I was studying economics at the same school and same time that Stephen Levitt released his tectonic shifting Freakonomics book, I knew that if you wanted to torpedo a social science into mainstream pop culture, then you have to ask a fascinatingly simple question. Mine, how do you grow your brand in a noisy world? That question was addictive enough to earn me a book deal with Wiley within 72 hours. What no one could anticipate was how the deafening noise would be accelerated by COVID-19 as people remain stuck at home, streaming content, and glued to social media. <sighs> Each week passing is a blur. In a world where chasing operational efficiency now takes a backseat to value creation, companies have to heavily rely on brand to weather the current storm. And the brands that were winning through double digit growth years ago didn't seem to purposefully have a behavioral science strategy, but rather lucked out from striking a perfect chord among a specific community through their communication. Simply put, they resonated. Well, buckle up, because we're gonna go on a quick tour through each of the five parts of Levesque, starting with lexicon, the part that produces all of the words that we use, actually about 7% of communication. You can think of this in marketing as all that copy that's getting put on pages and in advertisements. And on the web, you can think of this as all those key words, such as SEO strategy. And like knowing the password of a speakeasy and knocking on it and coming in, the goal is to strike a chord with the right language with the community. So the objective, a finding lexicon triggers is that they're both identifiable and common within the community. All right, we've arrived at our first stop on this journey and I hope you're hungry because I'm ordering us two animal style double doubles. Anyone on the West Coast of the United States out there? If so, you know one of my favorite farm to table chains that rivals McDonald's, in and out And for those of you that just want the password, Animal style double double just means a good old fashioned hamburger. Although not nearly the same size, the sun soaked Cali bread in and out chain punches well above its weight class through strong branded vocabulary for menu items. Why? Because we tend to chunk information. We tend to group things in pairs of two or three, and we tend to look for keywords. And many brands are benefiting from striking that chord. When those keywords start to trigger an emotional connection, then they become branded vocabulary. And over time, the community of users, consumers, clients, and beyond tap more into and invest more emotion into that secret lexicon. Branded vocabulary works best when you take a mundane moment along the customer journey and make it distinguishable through word choice, and or delivery style, or as my friend who studied linguistics at UChicago would remind me, paralinguistics. Oh no, we're late. Everyone else is boarded already. We have to make sure we go. <sighs> Just made it, okay. So Southwest Airlines, I mean, over 20 consecutive quarters of growth, they're probably the gold standard in terms of fast growing companies. I mean, we've all been on this customer journey of, of pre-flight safety instructions being said by stewards. The FAA mandates that it happens on every single flight. We tend to tune out. Yet Southwest Airlines creates a really memorable experience because they empower their stewards to use humor. They use a differentiated delivery style in order to resonate. By allowing their flight attendants to tell jokes, the airline elevates that mundane moment that we all tune out into a memorable experience that leaves the customer with a positive feeling for the brand and a bonding moment among the new community of passengers. Ah, finally, we've taken off a moment of peace and put on our headphones and just tune out for a moment. Let me turn up the volume. Oh, I love this song. All right, this is gonna take me down memory lane because years ago, I worked in the entertainment industry. And at the time, many of the things that I was doing started to calibrate and it landed me on Forbes 30 and a 30 between my client, Megan Trainer and Charlie XCX. 
to me, music is the universal language. It is literally the definition of resonance to be on the same frequency. Digital platforms, technology, completely up into the music industry's business model and how we as consumers navigate the world. Nowadays, your brand has a mere three seconds to capture attention before you get a swipe left or a click. Alexa, Siri, Bixby, whatever you name it, whatever you call it, those speakers are everywhere. And as of 2020, 40% of US households had at least one smart speaker. Whether you're trying to get the mood set right for a sale or develop a memorable mnemonic, audio branding is the future. And the jackpot, if you can reach the status of instant recognition. And many brands are benefiting from audio. You know what? Just sit back and relax. We're gonna be on the plane for a while. So as a matter of fact, how about you close your eyes? What I want you to imagine is your customer client, vendors, or external audiences trying to find your brand in a noisy world where they can't see you. No expensive commercials, no out of home, and maybe not even going in store. Is there any audio that will help differentiate you from your competitors? The reality is most brands fail the bird box test. Most brands are not identifiable by a single audio tone. As audio nudges and sonic signatures rise in popularity, along with hands-free devices, the ROI will continue to grow. All right, just a few minutes before we land. Let me hop on my phone and see if anything catches my eye. Mm-hmm. Oh, this meme of LeBron James dunking is so great. I'm just gonna share it for one moment. Let me just post it online. It's done. <laughs> oh, my community's gonna love that. Okay, since The reality is content is currency. And in COVID-19 reality, social media consumption is at all time highs. Phone calls are at all time highs with a 40% higher year over year compared to 2019. All that sharing, scrolling, and talking is bringing tribe members closer together. And brands that come out of COVID-19 in a strong and favorable position will always benefit by having a strong community that thrives off of talking to each other. And so as brands, what we wanna make sure is that we are creating those assets that individuals need to be conversational with each other and not necessarily try to maximize reach and repetition of catering to one person at a time. Did you know that 20 to 30% of social media posts contain a rich media asset like a meme, an emoji, a graphic, or a video? and up to 50% of text messages in some generations actually have some type of expression that's included in them also. So that led me to a piece of research. I had a theory that dictionaries are the code of agreement between communities, and that if I looked at different dictionaries and the pace at which those dictionaries were expanding or evolving in terms of the words or the graphics, then we could find some new trends. And we found a pretty big one. There is a current value premium being placed on the ability to compress messages. We seem to be returning to a glyph society with emojis and gifs, both shooting up in popularity over the last five year period. All right, finally, we've landed just in time to run a couple of errands. Experience is where rubber hits the road. All of the elements of the communication system, lexicon, audio, and visuals, mix together into a brand expression. Sometimes that expression is a communication, and sometimes it's a creative bag of nudges that might get you into a mindful playset. In spring 2018, 
Gartner conducted double blind research among 6,700 consumers in 15 countries. Their research revealed that 80% of consumers felt the experience they had with the brand in terms of the product and service was most important in terms of brand touch points. In 2018, IBM Institute for Business Value and Oxford Economics partnered on a study with 2,000 CMOs. Those CMOs found that 85% of them felt that experience was their biggest business threat and that all of them needed to ensure that they had really strong feedback loops. And the brands that have invested in different nudges and experiences have grown quite fast. For leaders, the goal is to get a community into normative behavior, traditions, habits, and rituals. The right experience-based nudges can send an electrifying message to any audience, helping a brand diffuse as many cognitive biases as possible. Last stop, home. In systems-based thinking, Donella Meadows reasons that the purpose of a system is the summation of outcomes. In other words, purpose must be matched by policies, practices, protocols, and values to ultimately create a shared culture. Culture is deeply personal to communities. It is the artifacts, beliefs, and behaviors of a population. So nailing culture usually means having a strong point of view, on what values you're willing to defend and what enemies you're willing. And when companies get that right, they're able to capture the attention of consumers and audiences in a very noisy and crowded world. So let's wind down this journey over a quick chat about brand safety and nudges. The culture ethics test was something that I created in order to give brand safety guidelines to different marketers, leaders, and individuals who are protecting themselves as they navigated the world of social media and content and this fast moving lane of behavioral science. And it's really based on three things, that we need to have empathy, empowerment, and earnestness. And when nudges go wrong, then we can go back and look at these three things and figure out, did we violate a key tenet of marketing or communicating or engaging a specific community. With hopeful impact on the field by now offering a scalable way to teach, implement, and measure behavioral science stimuli and impact for non-experts in language that they can understand from the standpoint of communication, I urge us all to consider Maybe we're ready to take that jump across the chasm into the mainstream and finally have a vehicle powerful yet flexible enough to make that journey. The work of Donella Meadows' theories on system-based thinking now influences supply chain, organizational governance, and environmentalism. It's time we welcome it into behavioral science. So don't forget to turn on your signals as you navigate. Lexicon trigger to get you to brand it vocabulary, audio cues to get you to select signatures, visual stimuli so that you spark conversations, experience drivers that turn into normative behavior, and cultural connections that ensure there's ethics that empower a community. From book club to book deal, I couldn't have had a better ROI for lucking out by looking around for a GPS system to navigate the roads of behavioral science.